Hi, and welcome to the Women Birth Collective's Pregnancy and Postpartum Summit. Today, we're talking to Christine Olsen, who is a Swedish doula, massage therapist, yoga teacher, and birth coach. She mentors her uh, clients with passion and guides them to strengthen and soften during pregnancy. She offers trauma-sensitive writing as a way to heal from tra traumatic experiences such as birth and... Um, she also is a lover of wild plants. So she's going to talk to us today about her uh, ancestry and some herbalism and what it's like to give birth in Sweden. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Mm, thanks for having me, Melissa. This is so exciting because it was just today that I discovered that you've been um, not just working with herbs and pregnant people, but also with um, recovering your own ancestry and the wisdom. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I'm from Sweden, I live in Sweden, and in Sweden, our indigenous people are the Sami people from the north of Sweden. And my grandfather is Sami, but during the colonies, he really uh, turned Swedish instead because it was so much easier to be accepted in the society. So I didn't know as a child that I had Sami origin. It was... Um, his uh, brothers and sisters in Norway who still really uh, protects and um, reclaim their Sami roots that gave me this dress that is particular for the Sami people. And uh, I think I was 10 years old. And then I, it was, I really felt in my heart that, oh, this is why I feel such a strong connection to nature. This is why I like to just go out and go barefoot and, uh, do things that other people like don't do so much with na being such in such a connection with nature so for me it was like coming home when I got this um this knowing that my roots are Sami and uh, and during the years I've, I've I've discovered more and more and really I really want to reclaim and uh, take back so much that has been pushed down or yeah, forgotten during this hundreds of years that's been that it's been forbidden. Mm, yeah, it's beautiful that you're gifted a, a dress, you know, and um, able to step into your Sami being. And I'm wondering, do you have any? Um, have you discovered any wisdom that you that you can pull into the actual pregnancies and births, and your own pregnancies and births, and those that you help? Yeah, one thing that is really, really touched me on a deep level is the word for our womb. And it's called in the North Sami language, that is my origin, that it's called Vulevaimu. And Vulevaimu, it means our lower heart. So we have our upper heart and our lower heart. And for me, it makes so much sense because it's a, it's a muscle. Our uterus is a muscle and it carries life it it yeah it's really like a big heart but it's a heart that can expand and then just go back again it's like yeah it's amazing and when I have my clients um we we, we use that a lot to reconnect with our lower heart and to like tune into our womb space like also when we're not pregnant but especially during pregnancy to really connect with the baby and to honor the the vulvaimo the womb and nourish her mm, the vulvaimo the womb and the lower heart I, I so many images come to mind when you talk about that because um when you have a baby in the womb the first thing that there is is the that electricity and the heartbeat that's the first sign of aliveness so you actually have two hearts within your body and a heart within your heart, your lower heart. So that's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Another, there's two more pieces that I want to share. One is the, um, I was recovering some Chinese wisdom and in traditional Chinese medicine, the heart and the mind are the same. Uh, it's one, they, they don't, they don't separate the heart and the mind, but the heart is also part of the womb, the bow. So it's all connected uh, and the Chinese, traditional Chinese um, honors that and, and views it in that way too. And then the third piece I wanna bring in is the, um, the Mohawk uh, Bear Clan Mama. She told me that 
everything that's created in the world is created through our womb space. So it's when women uh, circle up together and have their wombs facing each other and they dream through their wombs and they manifest what they want to see in the world. So mm -hmm. Such a powerful space. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and when you say that, the mother bear, oh, the bear clan, you said that. Mm -hmm. The bear is also the, the sacred animal for the Sami people. And uh, in ancient times, there was, uh, it was said that, you know, the Sami women, they had dresses and they didn't have, uh, they didn't have trousers because they, they wanted the connection with the earth from the, from the Yoni or the Vulavaima. And um, if there was a bear coming and was aggressive, uh, she just lifted her, <laughs> she just lifted her skirt and the bear was like, oh, you're a woman. And just turned uh, turn on, yeah. turn off in any way. And I don't know if it's just a story, but it's like it's still alive today that the connection between the women, the power of the women and the bear, it's like, yeah. Oh, that is so amazing. <laughs> so if, if she's getting attacked, she can just lift her skirt and say, no, no, look at this. Yeah. <laughs> look what I got. <laughs> and it would subdue the bear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah beautiful i love yeah. that i love that that story is alive and present yeah. that's, that's amazing yeah because yeah. it, it's powerful and it's fun as well i mean it might yeah it, we are powerful We're really powerful. yeah absolutely um i have a few friends who are mesoamerican birth keepers and they always wear skirts to have that connection with the earth but they also wear it to protect their wombs so it's kind of like a, um, or they'll, they'll wear a belt, uh, wrap a belt around their wombs that's uh, over their clothes, but it's yeah. for, it's in order to protect the Volovaimo. Mm. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about that. We have belt in our dress as well, but I haven't thought about that it might be. Mm. Yeah. I wonder, oh. it's interesting how many different traditional and indigenous um, people share similar beliefs about birth and similar practices about pregnancy birth and about the womb in particular mm -hmm. yeah I can just mention also that in mm -hmm. the Sami tradition it was a matri matriarchal you say matri matriarchy Ma uh, matriarchal matriarchal, yeah, matriarchal yeah. society mm -hmm. and uh, so they had three goddesses that was um, present during pregnancy and birth and postpartum Mm. so this uh, this one this sign here it's for uh, the goddess called saraka who is the one protecting when when giving birth mm -hmm. so um, i use this when i'm attending births and i use it when i have my my menstruation i don't have it now because i have a baby but i wanted mm -hmm. to use it today to just have the power of it so. beautiful Sa saraka saraika saraka saraka, saraka. And the other two, are they younger or and older uh, women, or are they just different? A different. Um... They are three sisters, Uksaka, Yuksaka, and Zaraka. And their mother is Madaraka, who is the great uh, ancient mother. Mother. So, mm. yeah. So it's beautiful, beautiful. Um, has this influenced you, this um, ancestry, this connection to your ancestral wisdom? Has it influenced you to pursue herbalism? Are there any um, roots and traditions that you get from the Sami ancestry uh, as you work with your herbalism? Yeah, partly. It's, it's mostly the connection with nature and to find herbs that is around where I live. My... my my relatives, they come from up in the mountains and I live more close to a city. I'm born here and grow, grow up here. So it's not, it's not the same herbs here as up in the mountains, but some are, some are the same. So, but what it has helped me with is to really make a connection and a relationship with the plants that I have around me because they are my allies now, allies now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful to be able to find um, new plants and create relationships with them. Yeah. Um, are there any in particular that you are drawn to or that you've um, developed a connection to and you are knowing um, that it's good for pregnancy, birth, postpartum? 
Yeah, my my best ally is the nettle, stinging stinging mm. nettle. Yeah. And so the the places where I found it that is not close to roads or that is not polluted, it's really my treasures. It's a uh, yeah, it's it's the herb that I I use it during pregnancy and birth and postpartum and otherwise as well because it's a really nourishing herb that is like for me it's like the best food I can drink just a nettle infusion in the morning because I know that it gives me proteins and minerals and vitamins and yeah so nettle is really it's my number one go-to it's the one I always bring with me if I'm going away I have some dried nettles with me because I feel the support so strongly Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and um and that's also the one I, I, I offer to my clients. I bring it to births. I have it in my prenatal appointments and, and especially postpartum when you, cause you lose, you lose blood during birth. So the nettle helps you to recover and build new blood. And it's also rich. I don't know if many people know, but nettle is very rich in K vitamin. So Many, many women drink it more just before birth so that the baby can get some. Mm, yeah. Baby. I've never heard that the uh, the concept of giving it to the baby, you know, drinking it for the baby, but I have heard that it's got um, the most minerals. It's the most mineral rich uh, and, and almost identical to what a prenatal vitamin is trying to become, right? Uh, yeah. You know, all of the minerals that you need for your body. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's common all over the world. You have it. I don't. I don't. Um, I think maybe a little bit north. I'm in a tropical, subtropical region um, of the United States. So okay. we're more like the Caribbean than anything else. So mm. I do I do think maybe there are nettles in certain regions of the Caribbean, but they don't, it doesn't really grow widespread. Um in Miami, you can plant it in your garden, but it's more of a um, something that's from you know uh, out of the region okay yeah but I yeah. have been to the mountains and I've been stung by some which is really <laughs> sweet <laughs> and it was growing next to blue and black cohosh which are the sisters from the Appalachia that uh yeah. they're two two herbs root herbs and they help with birth and abortions and um, placenta and all kinds of stuff so yeah I heard they are really powerful but we don't have them in Sweden so so I haven't used that one but but I know they are powerful yeah it's beautiful because I've I've used I I used them before I knew about them I mean before I met them in person um (laughs) and they're always used together blue cohosh black cohosh and uh they're so often they're combined but when you go to the forest and you see them they're growing like they're sleeping together like two roots kind of nestled into each other or not too far apart anyway. So I think that's what they call them, the sisters, I think. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I have to check it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same, same with yours. I have to come check yours out. Um, yeah. What's your <laughs> other one? What's your number two herb? My, my number two herb is dandelion. Mm. Yeah. Dandelion. And especially I use the roots a lot uh, to make tinctures to aid digest, digestion. Uh, and also, it's also rich in uh, in iron. And I didn't say it, but the nettle is really rich in iron. That's why it helps to build the blood and the hemoglobin. But also um, dandelion. And dandelion uh, consists of ingredients that's, that really helps to bring calcium out of the food, more calcium out of the, out of the food. So that's also good when growing a baby um, to get even more calcium. Yeah, is that in the root as well as the plant, or is it just the green parts of the dandelion? Mm. Is there a difference? No, I think it's both in the roots and in the in the leaves. Okay, okay. Yeah, and dandelion, you can get that in the grocery store, the uh, like a salad green, I think. Yeah. Oh, in Sweden, it's a weed, so people just <laughs> want to get rid of it. There's so, so much of it. So actually, now there are. People like asking, do you want me to come and uh, take take away your dandelions because it's so it's such a good herb. It's really mm. a good plant, and especially yeah, the the leaves I use them fresh in salad, um, but uh, I mostly 
I dry the roots and use them mostly because they are very potent to use. Mm. Like yeah. you just put a few drops of tincture in a glass of water when and drink before you eat. And then if you have like heartburn when you're pregnant, it really um, helps to prevent that you get that you get okay. heartburn. So. Oh, that's a great thing. Yeah, that's really how good. how can we know what's safe? You know, because uh, when you Google things, it's like, um, you know, there's not a lot of uh, testing, and so they just kind of say nothing is safe, right? Um, yeah. That's what Google will tell you. <laughs> how do we know what's safe, and how do we research and find our allies? Yeah, that's a really good question because there are different answers to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that because my number three is raspberry leaf and that's very different some say you shouldn't use it until a few weeks before birth because it's a uterine contraction it causes uterine contractions while like one of my teachers Susan Weed she said that uh, it's safe to use it moderate during pregnancy as well to strengthen slowly not drink it so much so I think that, I mean, there are some herbs that are really dangerous to, and that you shouldn't use, but um, I, I, I try to focus on when I'm working with clients, I focus on what's, what herbs that is safe, because otherwise it's so easy to get confused and like, oh, she said yarrow, was that safe or was it not safe? Mm -hmm. And like, like yarrow, I don't use it during pregnancy, but uh, it's very good postpartum. So mm. I try to like, when I guide my clients, I, I try to just say in this period that, that you're in right now, these herbs are good. But then I also want to say that what's safe, like you said, there isn't so much um, scientific proofs about what's safe or not. Or some, sometimes they just say that they don't know because they haven't tried it out on pregnant women. So they say, don't use it. Mm -hmm. But, but like nettle and dandelion these two are they are they are really safe mm -hmm. um, and like nettle is a nourishing herb it's like food so there's nothing that is like strong medicine in it um but like raspberry leaf yeah i wouldn't say that you should drink a lot early in pregnancy because it might cause contractions in the uterus mm -hmm. um, but what i want to say is that i really believe that each woman um no i think that we know in our vulva vimos or in our heart if we especially if we like connect to a plant out in nature i think it's different if you go to a grocery store and just see a package of a plant <laughs> but if right. you go out in nature and you like just sit down and ask this plant uh, are we a good fit right now i think i i believe that that's the most powerful way to to see if it's something that nourishes you because we are all different as well we have different yeah. needs and we have different so i think like the the real connection with the plant is the most powerful guidance that you can get yeah that's beautiful because you're you're not talking about working with the physical nature of a plant necessarily but maybe the energetics of the plant and how the energetics of the plant is going to work with your energy yeah Hmm. I um I'm not uh advising people to do this, but there's a plant that I took um uh, from my Jamaican tradition called Syracy. And there's always this question of is it toxic, is it not toxic? But it is traditionally given to pregnant women at, at certain points, you know, or or when they're in labor or postpartum at certain points. But there's still this question of like, is it too strong? Is it too strong for the liver? Is it going to cause like um uh, liver um, over an uh, exhaustion kind of overwork the liver overtax the liver to try to you know whatever it's doing to your body and and there is some element to that but for me when I was postpartum I was walking around the garden and there was a vine it's a weed also right like so many of the herbs are weeds that, and they just show up in your life when you need them <laughs> but it was growing on my fence and there was something about it that I just wanted to eat one leaf, you know, and I did, I ate one leaf and it felt like it, I was two days postpartum and it felt like as I ate that leaf, a couple hours later, my body had just kind of come back to its center from being like so open, you know, after the birth, it just felt like that leaf brought me here. And um, 
what was beautiful about it is I only needed one leaf <laughs> you know so I didn't have to have that question of like what am I doing in my body is this bad for me you know so I think that um uh, at least in, from my personal experience and again it's not advice you know I don't know what to tell people specifically about their um, consumption of herbs but from my experience a little bit goes a long way sometimes yeah so yeah that's beautiful and it was in your garden you said yeah yeah yeah. And I think that's a, like a number one thing. If you can go around where you live and see what what, what plants lives close to me, where where I, where have I been attracted? To, what place have I been attracted to? And what plants are here around here? Mm-hmm. And see what what calls you. And then I mean, you can look it up if you want. And there's many ways to to read more if you want to know more intellectually what's what's in it, but. But like you said, just the energy of a plant can do so much. I mean, you can pick it and have it in a glass of water and just like watch it as well. So that's right. I think, and if you feel like you want to eat a leaf, then yeah, probably it's it's good for you. I really think that if we're if we're really connected with our center and like our hearts, it's it's often very wise wisdom. Yeah, that's great. You can just pick it and put it in the glass and it still affects you. You can smell it and it affects you. Yeah. Um, there is one website that I do get my information from that I want to share just in case anybody listening. Um, it's Google Scholar. So if you type in Google Scholar into Google, it'll take you to the Google version of all of these um, uh, different um, studies and uh, scientific uh, you know, journals and things like that. And then if you from google scholar type in the herb or whatever it is you're looking for it'll pull up everything that has you know Mm. every every resource every journal every uh study every database that has a scientifically related aspect to that that word that you're searching it's a really good one wow i didn't know that that's great wow Uh, google scholar Mm -hmm. yeah you're welcome perfect Um, uh, are there any postpartum traditions from your Sami heritage that you've discovered? Yeah, one one is a porridge made of, of herbs that is uh, traditionally given to the woman and the women surrounding her when giving birth. But I don't know what herbs is in it. I just want to know, know one. And I just know the name in Sweden. It's in Swedish. I can't find it in English. So, But it's an herb from the mountain. So that's a tradition to to give this herbal um, porridge to the mother. And um, other postpartum tradition, it's it's like in many traditions of postpartum, it's like keeping the mother warm, to keeping her warm and nourished. So they use a lot of bone broth, for example, mm-hmm. um, from reindeers because that's their their animal that they live with often and um yeah and the fire the fire to really have a fire fireplace that that keeps the mother warm oh wow and i've been longing for that so much during my pregnancy and birth we don't have a fireplace where i inside where i live but i i had a lot of candles and <laughs> yeah i really felt that that i wanted the presence of the fire and yes. this goddess Saraka, she they say she lives under the fire. If you have a fireplace, that's where her her home base. So, wow, so that's, that's beautiful. A, beautiful. I gave yeah. birth next to a fire once. It was really sweet. Oh, <laughs> yeah. wow! It was painful mm. labor, but it was sweet to have. Um, yeah, some of the elements around. There was a little fire, a little rain. There was a uh, warm bathtub. Outside a blow-up bathtub, some banana trees, and, wow. uh, and a really good friend. Yeah. <laughs> and the stars. Oh, that's really good. It was a lot of. It was kind of painful, but it was it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, can you tell me what it's like to give birth in Sweden? I know in America, a lot of us birth professionals were like, uh, you know, that we always hear about how great it is to give birth in Sweden and it's a um, the cesarean rates are super low and the midwives are vast and plentiful and um, 
that the postpartum care is like so rich and full. So can you tell us oh, what you are saying? Yeah, this is, this is yeah, what we that's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be, would be wonderful, like you said, with the postpartum, if that was rich. I, I, we, I can get through that, but... But what's really good in our system is that the, there are a lot, a lot of midwives and it's the midwives who really have the responsibility at the hospitals for the birth. There, there are doctors as well, but they, do, they just contact them if there's something that they are not um, sure of. So often the women just meet the midwife during birth. Uh, so that's very beautiful. Um, and um, yeah, right now it's uh, hard to say that it's good because right now many midwives are uh, protesting. Do you say that? Uh, they yeah. are like they are quitting their jobs right now because it's so heavy for them. They are too. They are, they are not as many as they as they should be, and that's oh, not because yeah. they are not midwives. Because we have a lot of midwives, but a lot of midwives choose not to work at hospitals because it's such it's such hard work to to work there you have like you you just don't you don't just have one woman you maybe have like four women that you have to be with at the same time so it's very exhausting for a lot of a lot of midwives so they choose to work out of the hospitals like with prenatal care instead mm -hmm. so the prenatal care is also good in sweden Hmm. what I'm longing for is more of the and what I offer is more of the nourishing and loving support yeah uh, like massage and giving suggestions of good foods and herbs and just checking in how are you how are you feeling how are your relationships how is yeah I think that part is still missing here we have a, we have a really good care a really good medical care mothers and babies often uh, go through pregnancy and birth very well feeling good mm -hmm. um but i know many many women come to me for their second pregnancy because they feel they want more they want more loving support they want like really feel like someone sees them and and meets them and support them where they're at so and i think i think that's that's good because the medical system can't it's hard to have it all <laughs> they really yeah. they do a great job at what they do and if you want more support there are there are people who can give that as well so yeah, yeah. but do you what, know what how I, long a, um, a, a a prenatal visit is with a, a midwife in the medical system is yeah. it like a the first one, mm -hmm. so the first one is a long one maybe one hour mm -hmm. uh, and then they go through your like medical history and and what you eat and that that is the the best one because they talk about how is your relationships and yeah mm -hmm. to see where you're at, you're at with the start yeah and then maybe the appointments when you come for the rest of the times it's it's like maybe 15 minutes uh, so you you check your weight, you check your glucose, they they measure the belly, listen to the baby. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's short visits after the first one. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Is it the same in US? Uh, yeah. Well, I just interviewed a, an OB who wanted to talk about how to maximize your fifteen minutes with the doctor because ah. she finds that it's too short, but she's kind of. Um, she doesn't have the ability to give more time because, mm. you know, the management of how they manage and assign patients to different doctors and things like that. So she, yeah, she feels it's too short. Um, the midwives here are a little bit different because we don't have a medicalized institution of midwifery care. So most of the midwives are, or many of the midwives are independent and we do give extra time and extra mm -hmm. attention but we're not very widespread so you, you you know it's not common to find a midwife unless you know you know somebody who had a baby with a midwife or you know you go out of your way to find a midwife because you know you want a home birth or something but no there's not a I mean there are midwives in the hospital but um they're practicing more under that medical care 15 minutes and you know hmm. for the most part yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. So and where I live, there are there are not no home birth midwives at all. So mm. uh, in the whole of Sweden, it's only two cities that have home birth midwives in the medical system. Okay. And in many other cities, there aren't any midwives for okay. home birth at all so right now and during the pandemic more and more women wanted to give birth at home yeah. um, but there there are no midwives who attend home births in most places so mm. so that's a problem that's a yeah. huge problem it's not just that you have to I mean if you can find someone that can travel to you you can pay for it and, right but, but it costs a lot and um and it's not sure that she will get there before you give birth <laughs> so that's right yeah so that's a that's a problem in sweden as well that many midwives doesn't dare to to take the responsibility to attend home births yeah. right yeah that sounds like it's a it's a tough one because if you do want to have a home birth it's almost depending on where you are there's it's not an option are there people who are doing free birth yeah Is that on the rise yeah yeah it is as well um mm -hmm. yeah where i live it's uh, i think it's a few every every year who, who, pl who plan free free birth mm -hmm. um yeah and from for my last birth in february now when i give birth to our third mm -hmm. child we i also chose to to invite friends that really loves me yeah to be my support because i feel yeah, I feel so confident in my body and my baby and and I feel that if something doesn't feel right then I can go to the hospital I'm very grateful that there is this opportunity but I really want it to be in a, just a loving space this time and it was so quick so my friends didn't <laughs> they didn't uh, they couldn't arrive before she was born but they came wow, wow. they came afterwards and really gave me like the nourishing soup that I long for and massage and yeah that was be very beautiful oh how nice that's so yeah. lovely <laughs> but then after that it, it's hard with the system like to get your to get the babies I don't know how to say in English like the number like the number like the birth certificate phone. yeah the birth certificate it's mm -hmm. really hard to get it when you don't have any medical people attending your birth right so that was like the biggest problem oh wow <laughs> I mean, you really have to go to the hospital so yeah, someone yeah. Can, can see that you have given birth and yeah it takes a longer time and it's it's kind of not what you're longing for in the postpartum right <laughs> in yeah. the first days postpartum and i just i just i had three days at home and then i went to the hospital and it was just like the the magical bubble just like poof because oh, were, oh why, why didn't you go into the hospital and why uh, yeah it was and but the midwife that I met during my prenatal care she was very she really believed in me she was a good support of my choice so mm -hmm. I was happy for that yeah that's beautiful yeah oh well thank you for sharing your story um is there anything else that you want to that i didn't ask or i didn't cover or something anything else that's kind of sticking out in your mind mm. you want to share yeah you said about the postpartum care uh -huh. uh, that's, yeah that's that's really something we're, it's getting more and more postpartum doulas here in sweden because many people feel that that's the period that is really important but there is totally forgotten i mean we have appointments at the midwifery uh, at a midwife that we meet after birth as well but it's just one meeting to see if you have recovered well you're like your vag vaginal tissue but otherwise it's just like the baby's appointments to wait the baby and yeah wow yeah. so that's it's interesting that it's uh, that it's that it's said that it's rich and full yeah, because I guess I have this <laughs> idea that the postpartum care is very rich and that uh that there's like paid maternity leave for like six months or something yeah like that. <laughs> oh, yeah that one yeah it's paid for one year yeah one year okay yeah that's great uh, yeah and I think it's yeah it's one year or if it's not many, a few months more maybe yeah and the dad always get 10 days off from work after birth mm -hmm. 
paid so that that's really good but that's i mean that's something it's so natural for me so i don't even think about it but that's really i mean yeah it's a big barrier here a a huge barrier because um there's not a sometimes it's it's not paid right so there's no income coming in and then a lot of times the the fathers or the partners can't get time off so then you know the person the mother or whoever's home with the baby taking care of the newborn it might be home alone without an income mm. so it's a big big oh, problem that's really oh that's yeah. really sad that's yeah sad. it's tough and i think yeah and also with the breastfeeding it's much harder to keep breastfeed if you have to work get to work earlier so mm-hmm. yeah yes She's showing me her artwork. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, postpartum visits though with the midwives, they're pretty, at least the ones locally here, they're pretty good. We do a 24 hour visit, 48 hour visit or two to three day visit. And we do a lot of um, breastfeeding help and things like mm-hmm. that. And then we do maybe a three to four week visit. Uh, so we try to do at least four postpartum visits. Wow, that's at least scary. the home birth community here. Yeah. yeah, but I mean it's important, you know. I think. What do you do when you need help breastfeeding or when you need uh, more support? What do Swedish women and and postpartum people do? Yeah, they have at the hospitals. They have a small unit where you can come if you want help with breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. And there are also like lactation consultants that works only with breastfeeding. Uh, mm-hmm. that you can if you want more support like at home mm-hmm. so, and a lot of doulas also give support with breastfeeding so yeah how how common are doulas there does everyone have a doula no in my city that is a smaller city it's pretty rare i've been okay. to i've been to I've, I've assisted as a doula 12 births in mm-hmm. a couple of years so it's not it's not a lot and i i'm i'm the only active doula there are like two other ones who are educated but they don't work as it so but in the main town in stockholm it's very common there's mm-hmm. a big uh, big they are screaming for doulas <laughs> oh that's wonderful really getting more and more popular but i mean during the pandemic it was also we weren't allowed to to go with with a woman if she had her partner with her we weren't allowed to to follow to the hospital so that there also i was attending i was attending home birth as a doula during the pandemic for people who didn't want to go to the hospital and didn't want a total free birth i mean i i can't give medical support but i can give the emotional support right. so so some people chose to have me as a doula and so they free birthed but i was there supporting them as a doula and mm. in a nourishing way yeah so, yeah wow that's beautiful because I feel that's my that's my calling to be there for the women before birth and during the whole birth and after the birth it's like uh, that's where I feel that I can do the best my best work yeah that's beautiful um can you can you give me your best advice for pregnancy both birth and postpartum yeah, I would say that uh, really connect with your Vulvaimu, your lower heart. That's my biggest advice. And really honor her. Ask her, what do you need today? Because she is one, um, like one person, and your baby is one person, and they can both guide you in, in how you can support both baby and your Vulvaimu. And that's, yeah that's really powerful to ask her yeah. and also during the birth i call the i don't know how in sweden we say we don't say contractions we say like pains when you have the contractions they it's called pain um but i i prefer to call them like womb hugs because it's really like it's so powerful when you can really surrender into this this feeling of getting a really strong hug into your like mm. 
and really surrender into that. So a, a relation with your womb is, yeah. And after birth, I think it's the most essential to really, to really thank her and to give her warmth and uh, massage and yeah. Mm, that's my... And also, if I can say one more thing, I'm a write yourself guide. So I'm working with, um, with writing as a trauma sensitive healing practice. And I also encourage a lot of my clients to do that, to write both during pregnancy and um, as soon as you can after birth. Within two days is great if you can just write what comes up for you, not, not trying to write the birth story, but just write to. And there are different techniques that you can use, but I think it's powerful to just, just have a pen and a paper and yeah, see what wants to come through you. Mm, that's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for sharing your time and your perspective and your knowledge and your experience with us. It's really yeah. lovely to hear. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And yeah, I want to give a, P, a PDF with uh, some herbs that is good to use, like the ones I, I mentioned earlier and how you can use them. And also I'm having a new website getting designed right now because my old one is very old. <laughs> but um, there you can also find more info on how, how we can support you in different ways.